Everybody fall back. I'm stuck! Oh I'm shit, stuck. I'm, I'm stuck too. Alright, one more This might be the end. Keep retreating. Until we do. Okay. I might actually be able to end off myself. Um, I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die. It happens. I'm gonna die. Okay. More of them. Don't go up yet. Yeah. You guys got a lot, you guys. Oh, they're just yeah, he's coming. going for a rage. You got a juggernaut coming. Shot by a bunch of tinies. <laughs> uh, I think we got it. It was a good rage. Thanks. We raged them in a funnel. Yeah. I thought we were yeah, good save, guys. Much. Appreciate you. VR gameplay remains a kind of niche field for developers. With a comparatively small market and massive startup expenses, it's far easier for aspiring developers to stay on console and PC and not generally conserve themselves with it. The problem is, once you get the chance as a consumer to have a real VR experience, it's really hard to go back to interacting on a flat screen without thinking how all the other games you play would look and feel in VR. Half-Life Alex was a wake-up call that showed the entire industry its real, first, full-featured VR experience. It was incredible, and nobody has yet managed to push the ball as far forward as Valve did even years later. However, there are some contenders that are trying, and one of the best is After the Fall. Mechanically, this game is very simple, leveraging a Left 4 Dead style, four-person, co-op, PvE format, where the players fight off waves of ice zombies called Snowbreed, using an array of fully interactable weapons modeled after real-world guns. It's an arcade title, so looking realistic is as far as the realism actually goes. Everything else plays like a traditional zombie shooter, with players scavenging a currency called Harvest from each level they play, and hunting for encrypted floppy disks, which hold blueprints for gun parts that improve the various weapons players can use. New players can scavenge some weapons from the game world, or purchase them from the armory if they've collected enough Harvest. There is a brief campaign that takes new players through the initial set of maps that launched with the original game, after that, you get turned loose to do what you want, but some of the weapons can only be unlocked through the campaign, so you do want to push through it. It's reasonably short and can be completed in a couple of hours. Progression is centered around the collection of weapon upgrades, stored on floppy disks hidden throughout the various maps, with colors that indicate rarity, and rarity determining the difficulty at which a colored disk can be found. These disks unlock a selection of weapons, and attachment upgrades, as well as chipsets. Attachments affect the overall performance of the weapon, with higher rarity attachments resulting in characteristics that make the weapon easier to use against a more powerful snowbreed. Chipset upgrades give the weapon a unique perk, things like extra damage, recoil direction adjustments, or the ability to convert weapons to and from automatic fire depending on the standard characteristics. Chipsets come from playing mutator runs, which have additional modifiers that change how the player or the snowbreed perform. They are weighted so that players at all levels can still participate by selecting the appropriate base difficulty. Cosmetics are also a thing, and the vast majority of them are earned through gameplay. Each cosmetic is attached to a specific challenge that players have to complete before spending the harvest that they've already earned to access that cosmetic. So, players with a given skin have completed a specific achievement in order to have that skin. Skins can be applied to player characters and to the weapons themselves, 
and there are a lot of them, so it takes a while to unlock everything, making the cosmetics hunt extend well into the endgame. After the Fall lets you give your guns to other players for their own collection. This means that veteran players have the ability to boost other players up to their level, rather than needing to carry them through high-tier content. Though the veteran player is sacrificing a weapon to do this, and will need to rebuild that weapon when they get back to their armory. This is an amazing feature because it lets new players see what's possible, and get to play with high-level equipment while they earn the ability to build and modify it themselves. Preventing the kind of stratification that tends to happen between new and old players in other similar titles. In addition to guns, there are wrist-mounted devices that can further alter the flow of combat. These devices are triggered by rotating your hand, palm down, on the device you want to use, and then holding down the grab button on an Oculus controller. Like with gun parts, these devices are unlocked through floppy disks, but are not modifiable, and have their ammunition significantly limited, and centered around different crowd control effects that help bail you out of tight situations where you might otherwise die. Consumables are also available for purchase at various arcade machines in safe rooms scattered throughout a map. These single-use devices require the user to part with some of their harvest currency, but are the most powerful devices in the game, taking the form of explosives, like the pipe bomb, or even more powerful warhead, healing or rage boosters that heal injuries or overcharge player weapons, and wrist device charges that serve as the ammunition for the various wrist devices that players can use. Actual gameplay feels great, but VR does have an initial learning curve that includes getting used to some of the motion sickness-inducing movements that can foul up newcomers. I strongly recommend using Jump 2 position movement and Snap 2 angle turning, as these movement mechanics, while less immersive, are much more friendly to those sensitive to motion sickness and are typically included across all VR games. It took me about a week playing an hour a day before I felt comfortable using other movement methods, and players can switch between them during a run as needed. I also recommend selecting Advanced Reload during the After the Fall startup tutorial. This takes extra time to learn, but offers more rewards for using it at all difficulties, and is required when playing the highest difficulty content, so you'll have to learn it anyway. Each weapon has a different reload process, but the game highlights the next step as you perform a reload so that you can find the interactables on a gun quickly. After the Fall uses the same seasonal content model that most live service games favor, but progression is reasonable and predictable. Though some matches can take most of an hour on higher difficulties, most games can be completed in under 20 minutes with competent players and the right gear. You only progress on successful completion of a given run. If your whole team wipes out, you lose the floppies collected and have to try again. The VR aspect of this game is the real winner here. Despite being graphically unimpressive on the Oculus, VR makes the environment and interactions visceral and intimidating. After the Fall does a great job presenting its story passively through the environment, with NPC characters only hinting at the different events leading to the frozen apocalyptic hellscape this game is set in. Each environment and set piece builds the story, and it's something that players can notice passively as they move from room to room or arena. This might look unimpressive on a flat monitor due to recording limitations on the Oculus, but the in-game frame rate floats around 90 FPS, making the experience feel smooth, and making aiming with the various guns feel both natural and snappy. It also makes the act of aiming a physical skill that you develop in the real world. None of the perks or upgrades impact aiming or reloading because these are physical traits you have to practice to improve. After the fall, lets you reload as fast or slow as you, the individual, are capable of, and aiming is a matter of physically moving the weapon in a live 3D space. While this is more difficult than aiming in Halo or Call of Duty, it's also completely natural and intuitive to learn. People who struggle at console games can excel in VR, especially if you're already familiar with the principles of real-world gunplay. Using a weapon in After the Fall feels completely logical, and the individual weapons have enough character that their physical design can influence your choice to use it. For example, I tend to favor the Assault Carbine, modeled after an American M4, 
because I find its reloading process easier to do quickly. The alternate assault rifle in the game is the MT-47, a thinly veiled AK-47 which does more damage than the carbine, but has a charging handle located on the opposite side of the weapon. If you're right hand dominant like me, to reload you have to roll the weapon on its side and reach forward to chamber around. Narratively, after the fall takes place in an alternate reality Los Angeles, frozen in a never-ending catastrophic winter that is implied to be global in nature. The fall is the event that froze the whole planet over, and is connected in some way to the Snowbreed, the game's name for the ice zombies that wander the frozen world alongside Sprawl, a manifestation of the zombies that is plant-like and appears to be composed of the collected biomass of the Snowbreed. The Snowbreed and the Sprawl always manifest together, with Sprawl able to move and obstruct pathways, only weakening enough to be removed after the local Snowbreed are killed. Exactly how the two are connected is not elaborated upon, but the Sprawl appears to be responsible for the geological disruption across the various environments. What it's doing is not currently known, but there is an intelligence guiding its hand, with a voice that can be heard at least once during every run. Chronologically, the fall happened sometime in the mid to late 1990s, so the computers and technology are generally archaic and clunky, a theme which is handled consistently and overtly through the multitude of arcade cabinets, cassette players, and other old tech that survivors have repurposed to help run the world. This game is a love letter to classic 80s action movies and aesthetics with a soundtrack that fits the overall tone of the game. Each level available in the game takes place in a different part of LA, with set pieces and environment designs that make excellent use of the limited power available on the Oculus. Those with higher power VR can take advantage of better graphics and performance, as the game is available on most platforms through their respective stores. Each level is unique, and does an excellent job telling its own small story about the area, without any dialogue required, though various characters will chime in over the radio to comment on different set pieces the players might encounter. Chinatown, for example, takes place in a former survival settlement. At some point in the recent past, its defenders were attacked by a massive snowbreed horde that overwhelmed and destroyed it, converting the place into an infested battlefield that a team has to navigate. This is the shortest of the levels, and so is favored by players looking to rapidly grind for floppies. The Quarantine Center is by far the most ominous. This longer level tells the story of the early outbreak and the federal government's unsuccessful efforts to control it. Here, players navigate the remains of a military base. All around are wrecked or derelict military vehicles and piles of corpses and body bags that are implied to have been killed by the virus that created the snowbreed. Hollywood tells the story of a movie premiere that took place sometime early on in the outbreak before its worst effects set in but has since been overtaken by Snowbreed and then wrecked by catastrophic geological shifts, making transit across this part of LA difficult and meandering. Taken together, After the Fall is a very competent game, with a clear understanding of what it is and a good vision of what it wants to be. It's nowhere near the polish or optimization of a AAA title like Half-Life, and it's much smaller in scale than Boneworks or Skyrim VR. But what it does do is done well enough to remain compelling in spite of the occasional flaws. Networking remains a challenge, with dropped connections being the biggest issue a typical player will face. The peer-to-peer -peer matchmaking system means that if the host goes down, everybody gets kicked and nobody gets a reward, which sucks if this happens towards the end of a run. Another common problem is softlock when loading into new games. This issue forces all the players in the lobby to manually quit the game reload, and reform their parties. Aside from these issues, the game runs well, even on lower power platforms like Oculus, which has enough battery power to last between one and two hours without an external power source being connected. While I can't speak to the experience on other platforms, I do regularly see network indicators for Steam and PlayStation in-game, though Oculus remains by far the most common platform I encounter during gameplay. As communities go, after the fall, does a fair job incentivizing cooperation. Veteran players will often give newer players a high-tier gun in order to build a party that can effectively tackle higher-tier challenges. Toxic behavior is no more or less abundant than in other similar games, 
so expect the usual dose of swearing and saltiness. If you have a VR headset and are looking for something new, this is definitely a game to have in your library. While it lacks the polish of legendary titles like Half-Life Alex, it's still a great game and remains entertaining for the long haul, offering an array of challenges and cosmetic unlockables that last well into the endgame phase of play. But what do you all think about this? That's all I've got for today, so I'll catch you all later.